Welcome to D&D Builds, where we have an outlet to make all sorts of ridiculous Dungeons and Dragons characters and stop driving the people in our lives insane with them. Today, we're going to be figuring out how to play as some teenagers with attitude, aka the Power Rangers. We will be focusing more on the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but we'll make sure to hit a few of the other random incarnations as well. But I do have to call out that the Green Ranger is actually not going to fit into this build because he works a little differently than most other Power Rangers, since he actually summons a full-blown Dragon Zord, and he uses a dagger that is somehow a flute that he can play through a mask, all while it's somehow making sounds that don't sound like a flute at all. So he is just gonna be completely different, and we're gonna focus on the main team other than him. Now let's jump right into the build. Most of the Power Rangers are pretty normal humans, but I wanna make sure I have a little extra leeway, so we're gonna choose a human variant. And when you choose a human variant, you get a feat, but we're gonna keep that feat in our back pocket for later. But also as being a human, you get access to an additional skill, so we're just gonna grab Perception because it's generally pretty helpful for pretty much any D&D campaign. Then we get to choose a background and we're gonna go with Soldier. I feel like the Rangers are protectors of Earth and they kind of fall into more of a Soldier category because of it. Soldiers get skill proficiencies in Athletics and Intimidation and they get tool proficiencies in a gaming set and land vehicles. And this is especially helpful because there's plenty of versions of Power Rangers where they're summoning sort of cars instead of any sort of animal zord or anything like that. Now let's decide on some general stats for most of the Power Rangers. These might vary slightly depending on which ranger you're going with, but I'm trying to get the majority of the team all with one build. So we're going to go ahead and take strength and dump it because we're going to be focused a bit more on dexterity, which we will boost to 15 and then get another plus one from our human variant. Then we'll take our constitution also bump it to 15 and also get a plus one from our human variant as well. Then we'll take our intelligence, dump that, because frankly, teenagers kind of don't have everything sorted out a lot of the time. But we'll still go ahead and make up for that a little bit by boosting wisdom up to 14, because you are wise for your age. And then with the last couple points we have left over, thanks to using standard point buy from the player's handbook, we'll just go ahead and boost our charisma by two points, bringing it to 10, because they are fairly charismatic, even if they are pretty cheesy at time. And if you like diving into all those little minute details of building a character, you can do that even more because this video is sponsored by Southern New Hampshire University. They have plenty of courses revolved around game development and art that goes into games, so you can go on the full spectrum of everything you'd want to build your own game. And even if your interests vary a bit beyond that, there's over 200 different courses and classes for you to check out. And you can help support this channel just by going to the link down in the description and requesting some more information about any of their courses. But especially if you like diving into the mechanics of games as much as I do. But now back to the game at hand, because it's morphin' time. Now it's time to pick a starting class. And while I was very tempted to choose a ranger because it is the Power Rangers, in D&D that doesn't really fit because they know martial arts before they even become a Power Ranger, and there's one class that knows martial arts, and that's a monk. When you choose monk at first level, you get saving throws and strength and dexterity. You get access to simple weapons and short swords, and you get to choose two skills, so we're gonna choose acrobatics. And I was tempted to go with stealth, because I know there's more ninja-style Power Rangers, but they're very flashy and right in your face, so instead we'll just go with history, because they've been around for a long time. When you choose a monk at first level, you get access to unarmored or defense and so as long as you're not wearing armor which frankly they don't really seem to be in most of the show it's kind of like a flimsy spandex type of material unless you're going with some of the movies where it's a bit more legitimate armor but we're going with the show instead of the movies for most cases this will make your armor class 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your wisdom modifier also at first level you get access to martial arts making your unarmed attacks deal 1d4 plus your dexterity or strength modifier and you can automatically deal an unarmed attack as your bonus action as long as you use the attack action on your turn then at second level of monk you get access to key you get two key points at this level and they go up equal to your level in monk you can use that key for things like Flurry of Blows, allowing you to make two attacks as your bonus action instead of one, or you can use it for things like Step of the Wind, allowing you to take the Dash or Disengage action as a bonus action and doubling your jump distance, or you can use a key point towards Patient Defense, allowing you to take the Dodge action as a bonus action. Additionally, at second level, you get access to Unarmored Movement, increasing your movement speed by 10 feet while you're not wearing any armor or a shield, and that increases at certain levels in Monk. Then at third level of Monk, you get access to Deflect Missile 
missiles, allowing you to take any projectiles and just swat them out of the way or throw them back at your enemies, and you get access to a monastic tradition, also known as a monk subclass. And I like to think of this as the moment that the rangers get special weapons from Zordon or whoever's leading the rangers at that point in the show. So we're going to go ahead and choose a Kensai monk. This allows you to choose a much larger array of weapons. So if you want to be using a bow and arrow like the pink ranger, you can do that. Or if you want to be using a battle axe, you can do that too. Because choosing Path of the Kensai gives you access to Kensai weapons so we can really focus in on what your specialty is. And I want to go ahead and further that by using the feat that you got from choosing your variant human race. So whatever type of weapon that you wind up going with, depending on whichever ranger you decide to be, you can go ahead and amplify that even further based off of your feet. So if you have a weapon that deals slashing damage, go ahead and grab the feet slasher. If you have a weapon that deals piercing damage, grab piercer. Or bludgeoning damage, grab crusher. Or if you do have a type of ranged weapon that seems like more of a bow or crossbow or whatever, you can take things like sharpshooter or crossbow expert or anything that helps you the most. You also get additional features by having the path of the Kensai with things like agile parry, allowing you to gain plus two bonus to your AC at the start of your next turn while you're holding your specialized weapon, as long as you made some sort of unarmed attack as part of your attack action. Or you can use things like Kensai Shot, allowing you to use your bonus action to deal additional damage with a ranged weapon. And finally, you get access to Way of the Brush, giving you proficiency in calligrapher supplies or painter supplies, but that doesn't apply quite as much to most Power Rangers. Then at fourth level of Monk, you get access to an ability score improvement. So we're gonna go ahead and boost up our wisdom by two points, which helps our armor class and some other things that might help us a little later in the build. You also get access to slow fall at this level, allowing you to reduce some damage from falling. Then at fifth level of Monk, your martial arts die gets upgraded from 1d4 to 1d6, and you get access to the ever important extra attack. So you can attack twice as your main action instead of just once. And you also get access to the feature Stunning Strike. So when you do hit somebody with a monk weapon or an unarmed attack, you can use a key point to try and stun them. They gotta make a constitution saving throw against your wisdom DC. So that wisdom that we got at fourth level is a little more helpful. Then at sixth level, we're actually gonna do a multi-class. We need to find a way to get those zords so let's start bringing them in by diving into druid when you take the first level of druid you get access to some spell casting but i'm not going to focus too much on the spell casting for druids although there might be a few things that could apply there are points when the rangers do kind of heal each other in unique ways or have some other abilities that could be looked at as some spell casting but that won't be the primary focus of this build if you do want access to all of the spells that I think could apply, I will make sure to add them to the character sheet that's available over on Patreon, where you can get access to the character sheets for all of my builds, just like these awesome people do, or the especially awesome player character patrons, Zalvador, Kilon, Lumiere 97, The Dino 21, Yaksha Senpai, and Justin Miller. Or you can go even above and beyond that, like my Dungeon Master level patrons, Devin Happy, Benjamin, Tristan Bennett, Gamestake, Heyo, Eric Wade, and Michael. They get additional perks, including having D&D sessions Hosted by me that I stream right here on YouTube as well as over on Twitch. Or taking it another level beyond that, there's my god tier level patron, Kilo Kilo. He is absurdly helpful for everything related to my channel and I cannot thank him enough, although I try every chance I get. So if you want to know any of those spells, make sure to check that out. But the main focus of this build is going to be those zords that we can summon. And since in most cases you're actually riding inside of them, we're going to go ahead and play with that a bit. Because at second level of druid, you get access to wild shape, allowing you to transform yourself into a beast. There are some restrictions to the features of the beast, but you get some additional perks as well. For example, you can retain a good amount of the benefits that you get from other classes or from your race or background. You usually can't cast spells while you're in your beast shape, but you can maintain any of your stats that rely on your more mental related abilities. So your intelligence, wisdom, and charisma scores stay the same. Lastly, you can't actually choose a flying or swimming creature, at least not right away. You need to get to level 4 of Druid in order to get something with swimming speed, and level 8 in Druid in order to get something with flying. And just to amp this up even further, at this level of Druid, you get to choose a Druidic Circle, and we're definitely going to take Circle of the Moon. This will allow you to use your bonus action to transform into your wild shape rather than using your action, and you can use your spell slots to regain hit points 
while you're in your wild shape form. Additionally, you can actually transform into stronger creature because the strongest wild shape you can change into without being a moon druid is a challenge rating one. But just by choosing circle of the moon, your challenge rating is automatically set as high as one just from the start. And if you hadn't gone this path, you wouldn't have been able to do that until level eight of druid. And one other important thing to remember that when you're shape-shifting into these forms or calling your zords in this situation, you can still use certain features of your other class. So you regain the benefit of unarmored defense. So whenever you choose a shape, you can still use the dexterity of the new shape that you turn into and add it to the wisdom modifier that you already have. Add in another 10 and that's your armor class while you're in your beast shape. So by choosing this circle of the moon, there are certain parts of the Power Rangers where you can turn into a wolf. And a wolf is a totally normal thing to turn into as a druid, but you can step that up a notch by being a moon druid and turning into a dire wolf instead. Similarly, instead of turning into a giant frog, you can now turn into a giant toad. And I have to call out that the American actor who played the Power Ranger that could summon the giant frog was also the voice actor of the American dub of Bleach for Ichigo. You also get some other Power Ranger forms that could be super helpful depending on which version you're going with. You get access to a brown bear or even a giant eagle even if you can't quite use that one yet because you can't use flying speed at least not at this level of druid but you can also use things like a lion or a tiger then at third level of druid you get access to second level spell slots and then at fourth level of druid you get access to an ability score improvement so we're going to go ahead and boost up our wisdom by two more points which helps everything druid related including our armor class that we get from being a monk and our wild shape gets an improvement because now we can access swimming shapes then at fifth level of druid you get access to third level spell slots and then at sixth level of druid you get another feature from being a moon druid. Now the form you choose can be your druid level divided by three. So you can choose even stronger forms. Beasts that are challenge rating two really start applying a bit more, like an Allosaurus, which is pretty darn close to a Tyrannosaurus Rex, or a Quetzalcoatlus, which is about as close as you're gonna be able to get to a Pterodactyl. And I absolutely cannot forget to mention that you can also become a Sabertooth Tiger at this level, really playing homage to the Yellow Ranger. Also at this level of being a Moon Druid, you get Primal Strike. So now any attacks that you make as a beast count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistances to non-magical attacks. Then at seventh level of Druid, you get access to fourth level spell slots, and then at 8th level of Druid, you get another ability score improvement. So to help out our monk a little more, we're going to go ahead and boost our dexterity by two points. And our wild shapes are now allowed to be flying creatures. So we can really make use of those giant eagles or Quetzalcoatlus as much as we possibly want. Then at ninth level of Druid, you get access to a 5th level spell slot. And because you're a moon druid, you can now turn into a challenge rating three beast in case you wanted a slightly stronger beast to turn into. Then at 10th level of druid, you get access to another feature from Circle of the Moon. You get elemental wild shapes. So you can actually turn into an air, earth, fire, or water elemental if you wanted to, but it requires you to expend two uses of your wild shape instead of just one. Then at 11th level of druid, you get access to a sixth level spell slot. And then at 12th level of druid, you get an ability score improvement. So we're just gonna go ahead and max out our wisdom while we can and you can finally turn into a challenge rating four beast which notably allows us to turn into an elephant or a stegosaurus and then at 13th level of druid we get access to a seventh level spell slot and then at 14th level of druid we get access to a feature from being a moon druid called thousand forms allowing you to use the spell alter self at will then at 15th level of druid you get access to an eighth level spell slot and we can now transform into a challenge rating five creature which which gives us access to a Triceratops, just in case you really wanted to go the path of the Blue Ranger. This does take us to level 20 of this build overall, leaving us just short of being able to turn into a challenge rating six creature, which would have been a mammoth, which is about as close as you're gonna get to a Mastodon for the Black Ranger, but you can still turn into some other forms. And if there's any other forms you feel like you kind of missed, that's okay because you also get access to the spell Polymorph. So you can actually change into any creature that has a challenge rating equal to or less than your current level overall, 
which is up to a challenge rating 20, which has a lot of choices. You do miss out on some additional benefits that you get from actually being able to use wild shape, but it still covers all of our bases in case there's any forms that you wanted to turn into that you didn't get a chance to. But no matter what, you have tons of animals to turn into, including giant apes and dire wolves or dinosaurs to turn into from a triceratops to a pterodactyl or quetzalcoatlus and using polymorph you can turn into a tyrannosaurus rex i've had plenty of requests for power rangers so i'm happy i finally got to make it let me know what you think about this build in the comments down below and especially let me know your favorite version of power rangers or maybe even your favorite ranger if you feel like you missed out on any of the spells that might have been available you can always check out my Patreon, linked in the description down below. And if you made it all the way to the end of this build, let me know by hitting that like button. And I'll be here hoping you roll at least three nat 20s on your next D&D session. Especially if you want to say it's morphin' time and play as a Power Ranger in Dungeons & Dragons.